Hello, everybody. My name is John Leslie, and we are talking about radio. And I've really been looking forward to our, our guest today. It's uh, not often they get a chance to talk to or interview royalty. <laughs> oh, <geez>. <laughs> <laughs> our guest today is the famous... John Records Landecker. Yeah, but you're a Michigander by birth. Ann Arbor, to be specific. Yeah, yeah. And just had a birthday. Oh, yeah, to remind me of that. Well, <laughs> uh, yes, I did. Yeah. <laughs> but, but I got to tell you, 1947 was a good year for broadcasting because I was born in 1947 as well. Uh, wow. June 15th. So we're just a few weeks apart in our birth. And I came out of the womb knowing that I was going to get into the broadcasting business. Um, <laughs> how many right. times, how many times have you been interviewed? I never kept a record. I, you know, I, I have, I really, I mean, I can recall specific interviews, but certainly no numerical total. Uh -huh. I don't know. Uh -huh. It's a, pro probably some or a bunch anyhow. Yes. It's some. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> More than one. You went to school in Michigan. Yes. I did. I grew up in Ann Arbor. Mm -hmm. uh, my father was a professor at the University of Michigan. I attended what was called the University of Michigan High School. It was run by the University of Michigan School of Education. And then for about uh, two years, I went to Grand Valley State University and then transferred to Michigan State University. Was that the, the they had a radio station there? Right. Oh, they had more than a radio station. They had a complete communication arts department. At the time, one of the best in the country. It encompassed not just radio, but television, advertising, public relations. They had it all. And and that was the curriculum that you studied. Yes, indeed. Yeah. What was your first, very first broadcast station? That would be W O I A slash. W O I B <laughs> Ann Arbor, Celine, Michigan. When I I probably walked out there when I was somewhere around my I would say junior or senior year in high school. Boy, so many of us uh get the bug in, in that time. That's I started, you know, sixty five, sixty six. Mm -hmm. I I was still in high school, you know, hung around the radio right. station. Uh exactly. And got thrown out. And uh, and came back. <laughs> well, the first job I ever had, there was a janitor for a dollar fifteen an hour. <laughs> and you, you were the janitor, really? <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> and that was just so that you could get your foot in the door, and, absolutely, and, and get to know the people. You bet. You bet. Yeah. So then, after that time, uh, that. Did you realize at the time that you had the potential to um, do what you ultimately end up where you ultimately did end up and, and the success that you had? Was there ever a time that you said, yeah, maybe I ought to go down and put tires on cars? No, um, but I didn't really think about all of it in the context that you're presenting. I was initially just doing something that I was attracted to. And it was a lot of fun mm -hmm. and it just sort of kept snowballing on its own. Um, I never really considered I'm going to have a career in radio. That's a good question. I don't know when I actually, well, I actually thought about it when I, um, I guess the one event that cemented it was I was um, going to Michigan State University and uh, working at a local radio station in, in Lansing, WILS, and a couple of radio geeks who weren't in broadcasting uh, sent a recording of my program to a afternoon disc jockey at a really big station in the Detroit area, who then transferred to Philadelphia and took the tape with him and played it for the program director in Philadelphia. And then I got a call mm -hmm. out of the out of the clear blue sky, asking me if I would like to fly in for a job interview, which I did. 
And I dropped out of my senior year at Michigan State to take a full-time job in Philadelphia. And I guess, you know, putting it in the context of your question, I guess that was the moment that I became a broadcaster, so to speak. That would be a little sobering uh, to go from Lansing, was it, to WIBG in Philadelphia. And and you certainly had your work cut out for you. That was, what, six, not, about 1969-ish? Uh, that sounds about right. Um, yeah. And, yeah. And, and and the big gun at that time in Philadelphia was uh, um, George Michael at FIL. Right. WFIL. Well, there's a little bit more stress to it than just going to a big town um, or big market. When I got to the station in Philadelphia, the program director, I changed my name to Scott Walker. And... Uh, I didn't like that, but I had committed, and so I stuck it out, uh, not doing very well, but he didn't fire me. And then eventually the station was sold, and a new programming team came in, and they allowed me to go back to my real name. Mm -hmm. And then things began to take off. Yeah. What was your? I was I was your, opposite. I was opposite uh, George Michael. Yeah, yeah. What was what was the time slot? Six to ten at night. Six to ten. Yeah. And uh, WIBG was what nine ninety, I think. Uh, on, yes. And uh, yep. we're talking with John Records Landecker from Chicago, and um, I, I had a, a slight connection. Or I, I had a real connection with WFIL over the years. It was owned by Triangle Broadcasting. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Walter Annenberg, who was the ambassador oh to God. England. Yeah, and Reader's Digest. Yes, and TV Guide yeah. magazine. Yes. Exactly. Oh, I'm sorry, TV Guide, right. Yeah. I don't know about Reader's Digest. I got the wrong magazine there. But yeah, <laughs> yeah. TV Guide, absolutely. Yeah, and he, and he had group station groups in, in Philadelphia, Binghamton, New York, Altoona, Pennsylvania, uh, Bakersfield or Sacramento, California, I, I forget which, and, and some other groups around. And I was hired to work at uh, the WNBF AM FM TV group in mm. Bing Binghamton, New York in 1971. And it was that was about the year that, you went, left Philadelphia and went to Chicago. That's uh, about right. Uh, I came to Chicago uh, late 71, early 1972. Now, how did that happen? Um, did the they same approach way, you? No. Yeah. <laughs> when I said that this career in the initially had a life of its own, I, that's exactly what I meant. Uh, the story I get is that um, now, this is just the way I heard it. I was busting my butt to try to get listeners uh, to WIBG at night. And it was working. And the way the story is related to me is that Jay Cook was the program director of WFIL. And he was good friends with Rick Sklar, who was the program director of WABC in New York. In New York, yeah. And was owned by the ABC network, as was WLS in Chicago. And WLS in Chicago decided they had an opening. And Jay Cook recommended to Rick Sklar, who recommended to the PD in Chicago named Mike McCormick, that they checked me out. And unbeknownst to me, Mike McCormick came to Philadelphia <laughs> and heard my show, went back to Chicago, called me, asked me to send a tape and resume, and then asked me to fly in for a job interview. And that's that. And they did, they did the head hunting. They, they obviously yeah. did not yeah. put an ad in broadcasting magazine. No. Well, or... I don't know. I don't believe they did. I never checked that out, but, um, once again, it wasn't anything on my initiative. Mm -hmm. It just sort of came to me. Well, so that's to the speak. that's the fun way to go. That's the that's the best way. It puts you in charge. Uh, well, I don't know if it puts me in charge, well, but it puts yeah. me on the radio station. <laughs> I mean, once again, okay, I had gone back to being John Records Landecker <clears throat> at WIBG, and then when I came to WLS, 
they told me I couldn't use my middle name. So that went on for a while, and then that program director left, and I immediately went back to using the entire name, and by the time the next program director came in, it was too late. <laughs> now, did, did they the ever... Damage, the did, damage had been done. Did they ever say what was their rub with using... I, I mean, it's, I it's great. It's, I uh, mean, how much better could it be? I, I have absolutely no idea. Why? Maybe because they didn't have any anybody else on the air with three names. I, I really don't know. I, you know, <laughs> I, I, I've told this. I really don't know. I've told this story uh, in the past when when I was hired by Triangle, I was using my my birth first name Jan Leslie, yeah. and um, once I got to Binghamton, New York, which was at that time the biggest market that I had wor- worked in. Uh, right. The general manager called me in and said, I will not have somebody on my air named Jan. And, and I, the reason for that is what? I, I, so not, that's what I said. I said, that's my name. That's what my parents, you know, this is good, a good Slovak name. And, I, and I've used it ever since I started. And he said, we're not here to discuss it. Uh, he said, you can either use John Leslie or Roger Clark. <laughs> and, <laughs> God. And, and who knows what yeah, the who knows what goes through the minds of these people? Yeah, I mean, it makes no sense at <laughs> all. Know. Well, for the next fifty years, then uh, I was John Leslie. I opted not to take the name Roger Clark. Good idea. Yeah. So now you you've um, were, were you doing the same shtick on on uh, uh, WIBG, and you took your your gig over to WLS or did you have to more or change? Less, more or less. I mean, um, and the NWIBG was very, I, I don't know what the word is. Um, did not have a tight format. Let's put it that way. And I was doing pretty much whatever I wanted to. And then when I came to WLS, uh, that was not the case, but I think in the beginning, basically, I would took what I was doing at WIBG to WLS, tried to adapt it to what their format was. But then over the years, it changed mm-hmm. at WLS considerably. Uh, we're talking with John Landecker uh, in Chicago uh, of WLS fame, WIBG fame, and others of uh, the Boogie Check fame and uh, <laughs> all those little things. So now... You're so in, in 71, you would have been uh, 72 when you went to WLS. You would have been my age, which would have been 21 yeah. or two. That's about right. Something like that. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, so did you say to yourself, John, I'm here. I, I have arrived. No. Um, I was too busy trying to fit in. Mm-hmm. Um, you see, that was one of the things over the years at WLS in the seventies, where it became ex- a, a really large successful radio station mm-hmm. is that the air staff never said to themselves, I have arrived. Um, in fact, we didn't even, we didn't realize, nor did we care, I suppose the extent to which the station was being received. Um, It was more, it was more of, and this is the absolute truth. It was more of an opportunity for us. And this is an actual term we use for us to use the station as a tool for our amusement. (laughs) And that's what we did. What a great assignment. (laughs) That was, well, nobody gave us the assignment. We made it up. We were, Sending coded messages to one another, um, showing up on one another's shows, hanging out on the weekend. Um, it was it was not an ego trip. Let's put okay. it that way. You know, yeah. I, I was going to ask you about that. That was one of the one of the questions I had was how how well the staff got along. And and uh, when I, you know, I've seen the uh, the reunion videos and uh, other pieces of uh, video around from your time there uh, and it just it, the the fun jumps out i mean you, you see it right right absolutely and it extended throughout the radio station 
Um, the engineering department was included in it, the news department, uh, promotions. It was one big package. Mm -hmm. Everybody got along with everybody else. Nobody was excluded from things that we did. Um, and it just was a great, great time. Yeah, and and it it was audible on the air. Maybe right. maybe more even you know for we radio people because I, I used to listen to you. You know, even though I was employed elsewhere on right. other radio stations, uh, right. you know, I looked up to you guys. I, I read Larry Lujak's book. Right, uh, I was one of the handful of people who did that. And... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And I, I laughed out loud. I, I, I read it in bed at night, you know, and and he made reference to a guy in Seattle by name who I worked for in Kansas City. And and in, in his book, he described this guy exactly, <laughs> exactly the way this guy was. <laughs> and my poor wife was trying to go to sleep, and I just busted out laughing. <laughs> and I said, I said it was so great to so great to see this in print because right. this is exactly what that he said it looks like a bulldog, <laughs> and, right. he, and he did. Uh, so now who people came and left during during that time uh, seventy two your first run there was yeah. seventy two to eighty one so we're talking about right. nine years. Right. Uh, some people came and left, and when did? WCFL, uh, didn't they take a run at you guys somewhere? Well, in they there? always did. Uh, th there had been a um, battle between WLS and WCFL that went all the way back into the 60s um, and continued on until they decided to switch formats. So they were a competitor of ours as long as I was there up yeah. until this format change that they decided to to implore, implement. Now it, it's we're talking with John Landecker in Chicago of WLS fame and and others. And um, who, who won the the ongoing contest? Did you guys manage to stay in the lead most of the time or all of the oh, time? Oh, absolutely. I don't know. Absolutely. I mean, there may have been um, a day part here or a day part there that slipped a little bit for a couple of months, but no. I mean, you don't change your station's format if you're doing well. Yeah. So there's the proof right there. Well, in in uh, in markets the size of Chicago and New York and other major markets, uh, a, a slight movement in the ratings is important to the tune of millions of dollars. Uh, you know, in the smaller markets, the numbers can go up eight, ten points, or down two or right. three points. But right. in the major markets, it's a you know a quarter of a point can be dangerous. Right. Yeah, oh yeah, absolutely. How much um how much freedom well I, I guess maybe you have answered that question, but do you did your program director ever come in and say, John, you gotta cut that out or I don't like that, or uh was it was there any program director type pressure on you? Well, uh initially, yeah, the first program director, but here's the thing that happens. My ratings were really, really good which gave me leverage. So if your ratings are great, you get to do just about whatever you want. Mm -hmm. um, because nobody's going to argue with you. Yeah. I mean, there was an occasional this or that, but nothing um, dramatic. Let's put it that way. One of the things that impresses me um, and has always impressed me about your radio station and about virtually everybody who is there. I, I I couldn't listen to Lou Jack because the the morning signal didn't get to where I was, right? And that was the same. I worked at a fifty thousand watt station doing mornings, and we covered three or four states. And the night guys, the talk guys in the evening, and the oldies yeah. guys, there were thirty eight states, you know. And, right. Oh yeah. Um, but I could the energy that flowed out, and and the energy that was visible when I would watch these videos that you. I, I was always amazed at how you kept that high level of energy uh, at, at that fast moving pace that you had to have in order to produce the product that you produced. Well, I guess I, I don't have a standard answer to that question because um, I don't think anybody's ever asked it before. 
I was young, and that's the way I wanted to do it. Mm -hmm. Pretty much end of story. Um, I can't think of any other reason. And it didn't stay at that level throughout my entire WLS tenure. You know, over the years, it calmed out a little bit. Let's Mm -hmm. put it that way. But in the beginning, oh, yeah. Yeah, It was high energy, absolutely. Yeah, age has a lot to do with that, you know. <laughs> now, who who thunk up? I, obviously, you did uh, the uh, the boogie check. Uh, was that with you all the time at W? Uh, oh, the whole no. time you were there, or no, 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 no. I wish there was some grand story behind it, but there isn't. Let me try to take you through my slightly eclectic thought process on this. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, at the time in the early seventies, the term "let's boogie." was a slang expression. Yeah, pretty prominent. It appeared it appeared on T-shirts and other items. Yeah. The disc jockey at WCFL, who was on opposite me, decided to make that his thing. Oh. He, boog- he was boogie this, he was boogie that. We had another air personality, air personality on our staff named J.J. Jeffrey, and he was single, and he had a mustache. And before he went out on a date, he would look in the mirror, check his mustache, and conduct what he called a booger check. <laughs> so one night without any without any planning or anything like that at all, I, I just decided, hey, you know what? I'm going to answer the phone on the air, and I'm going to call it boogie check, and away it went. And that's it. <laughs> And it was a rapid fire, about a two minute thing, two or three well, minutes. Yeah, in the beginning it was. Yeah, it was in the beginning. It was called the sixty second boogie check, so the program directors wouldn't have a heart attack. <laughs> but as time went on, it could last a minute, two minutes. Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah, depending on how it was going. We're talking with John Records Landecker, and I uh, refresh my memory, John. What what would be some of the things that people said on on the boogie check? Oh my God! Anything, I, I guess. They, huh? they were teenagers. Uh, I have absolutely no recollection of uh, anything specific that somebody said to me um, because it was so rapid fire. Um, gosh. I, I don't have an answer for that. Did they talk about music? Did they say hello? Did oh they no, say- I didn't give them a no. I didn't give them a chance to talk. They had to. The, the premise was looking for the alleged humorous phone call, which is you, which implied that whoever was calling in was supposed to contribute something. I don't remember specific um, contributions, but I do remember that in the beginning there was no delay system on the radio station because what what AM station rock station takes live calls on the air. Yeah. All the requests are pre-recorded. All the dedications are just written by the jock. And I was taking unscreened phone calls live and (laughs) it wasn't long before some kids said, fuck. Uh, And, And once that got out, whoa, yeah, the place went crazy. And it went on for a while, and the FCC had some sort of rule where you were so quote, supposed to, quote, unquote, do whatever you can on your power to keep these phone calls off the air. <laughs> well, that, well, that's fine, but if I've just answered an on-screen phone call and the kid said it, it's already on the air. Right. So that went on for a brief period of time, and the WLS engineering department came up with a delay system. Mm-hmm. But that's maybe the only thing off the top of my head that was specifically said by callers. <laughs> well, the, yeah. the typical seven-second delay back in those days was a, literally a tape machine. That, that's what they constructed, yeah. Yeah, it had the, the playback head. was seven se- There was seven seconds yep. of tape, yep. and uh, the geniuses who – uh, set up my tape delay uh, on my talk shows came up with this notion that they were going to put, they didn't want seven seconds of dead air. So they would put seven seconds of music on that loop. So every time I had to scrub a call, I would push the button and people would hear seven seconds of music. 
and it signaled to the audience what had happened. I was right. editing uh, a call or, right. or, or blocking it out. So it became right. a thing yeah. for people to call in and see how many times they could make me trigger. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so I, I said, at least put a jingle on there, you know, right. <laughs> something. Right. right. All right. Well, now, uh, who was the most uh, stable staff that you had during that time from 71, 72 to 81? Well, I'd say it was Larry Lujak, Tommy Edwards, Bob Surratt, myself, uh, Bill Bailey, Fred Yvonne Winston. Daniels. Uh, there were other people who came in and out, Chuck mm-hmm. Knapp, uh, Gary Gears, Charlie Van Dyke. Now, when you left uh, LS in 81, mm-hmm. uh, uh, you went to Windsor, uh, to Detroit, Windsor, Ontario. No, I went to uh, Toronto. Toronto. Toronto, Canada. Toronto, Canada, and worked for a, did mornings on a station there called CFTR. Okay. Oh, you did mornings. So that's the opposite end of the day, yeah. 4 30 a.m. time. Yeah. Right, right. Now, Chum was big then in Toronto. Uh, they were a competitor, yeah. Yep. Yeah, their their signal came down into the states, and I think down through the Midwest Flyway, they had quite a, quite a, a solid listening base there. Did CFTR uh, was it a local station, or did it have a big signal too? Oh, I think it had a pretty big signal. It was located at six eighty on the dial. Um, I don't remember its exact power, but. It was, the signal was not a problem. Let's just put it that way. Yeah. Okay. For those who are listening, I just want to remind you that our our guest is uh, John Landecker, the the guest that I've hoped for a long time to get on this program. (laughs) And uh, I I just, John, you know, over the years, listening to you, uh, I was, well, I was exactly the same age as you were. Right. And I looked up to you, you know, and when I was a kid uh, and I had my silver tone transistor radio from um, Sears and yeah. and I would sit there and listen to it and listen to these, you know, W.O.W.O. and even right. L.S. and the Detroit, mostly the Detroit stations because we had family right. in Detroit. And yeah. uh, I, I would say to myself, Jan, I wasn't John then, nor was I Roger Clark. Right. I, I was still Jan then. And uh I, I said to myself, one of these days, that's going to be me. Mm. And, and and I could just feel the magic. I could see the magic coming out of the speakers. And and so that's what I, I looked up to you because you were, even in my, my, my 20, my years, my 20s and 30s, you were the guy that had the job that I wanted, you know. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Uh now who who do you look up to? Now or then? And then, then then. Well, when I was growing up in the Detroit area, there were two people, um well maybe three. Um uh, air personalities named Joel Sebastian. Okay. Uh Lee Allen. Uh-huh. Um Well Dick Purton would have been Dick, on there. Dick, Dick Shannon, uh, Tom Shannon, mm-hmm. and also Dick Burton, yeah. yeah. And then J.P. McCarthy was doing mornings. Mornings, but that was um, that was an adult station. Yeah. You know, uh, over the years, though, one, uh, a guy named Ron Britton. Oh, yeah. Who used to be on WCFL at night, I discovered when I was going to college. And he was amazing. That was one of the wildest things I'd ever heard. I remember him, and, and I remember yeah. listening to him on CFL, Chicago Federation of Labor. <laughs> That's right. That's right. And, and they had a good sound, you know. I, they're... Oh, at one point, hey, I thought they were the best. I mean, I wasn't really, I, re- I really wasn't aware of WLS, quite frankly. Um the station out of Chicago that I listened to was WCFL. Mm-hmm. Uh, I just thought they had a very unique personality, 
format combined with music. I thought it was great. Well, I, I had a, uh, I'll, I'll tell you my little story here about Chicago and, and an opportunity that presented itself. I was working in Des Moines at KSO. Uh, it was a country station and uh, music format didn't really make a whole lot of difference to me doing a morning show. It didn't, whatever music I played, my shtick was what was getting the numbers. And, right. and so we had a really big book. Uh, I mean, a really big book. <laughs> and, and I got a call from a guy by the name of Al Mitchell. Uh, he was the uh, program director of WIND in Chicago. Uh -huh. And uh, Al said, uh, your name has been forwarded to me. Not unlike, you know, your earlier story. Right. Yeah. And it was Westinghouse station. And he said, we have a morning show opening here. And he said, I'd like for you to rack up a tape tomorrow morning and uh, an unscoped tape and get it to me right away. So the next morning I went in and I forgot uh, because we had a huge uh, lumberyard fire in downtown oh, wow. Des Moines that disrupted yeah. everything. And, yeah. you know, that's all I could talk about all morning long. And by that time, I had spent 25 years in the volunteer fire rescue service. Oh, wow. And so I'm on the air, and I'm telling the audience uh, how much water the fire trucks are pumping and who made the fire right. trucks and right, where, where right, the fire right. trucks came from. And, and, right. You know, and I'm going the whole – and I calculated the total amount of water consumption that they were taking, Whoa. you know, and – and I and and I talked about the Scott air packs that the firemen were wearing, and on and on and on. Well, in any, any event, I forgot to uh, rack up a tape, and uh, so I got off the air, and the, they said you got a call on hold. I picked it up, and it was Al Mitchell from Chicago, right, right. and he said I didn't want to wait for your tape. I flew into Des Moines and listened to your radio program this morning. He said I have never heard a more informational morning show. I'll ever. bet. <laughs> I, absolutely. And so the next thing I know, my wife and I are in Chicago. They want me to go up against uh, Wally Phillips. Oh, forget w that. Yeah. You know, I'm saying, <laughs> you know, come on. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody ever succeeded against Wally Phillips. You know, I was Nobody. I wasn't Nobody. so dumb yeah. to think that I could, I think they were a 5,000 watt station and they oh, they're were, nothing they're five sixty or something on the dial or something yeah. that they're down at the end. Yeah. yeah. Nobody goes down there. No. Yeah. And, and, and so I, I was very fortunate. Uh, Al Mitchell relocated <laughs> by the time he hired me. I mean, when the time came that he would have offered me the job, he was no longer there. Right. So that that went down the drain. And I don't think I would have taken it anyhow because it would have been suicide to It would have been. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, but then you know it's how you know what a great thing, you know, to be offered a job like that in, in Chicago That's and, true. and uh That's true. But still, you know, and, and how great would it have been if I did get in there and did make a mark in it, which I knew better anyhow. All right, so l let's move you along here now. You you went to uh, Toronto doing mornings and right. it was a whole different deal for you. And yeah. then back to WLS. No, then back to a station called the loop, which was an FM station. Um, then over to a station that was called G one Oh six. And then they changed their call letters to WCKG. And then after that, I did go back to WLS briefly and then wls changed to a talk format yeah isn't that uh, sad which i i was not a part of and off to cleveland yes i was in cleveland not that long about a year and a half mm -hmm. maybe and um then actually went to work for a talent agent in chicago that didn't last very long. And then I did a 10 year stint doing mornings on a station in Chicago at 104.3. Was that, uh, 
WJMK were the call letters. J- JMK, it's a, an FM station. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh yeah. Now you did mornings. Uh, well, yeah. I, I, did you did you do basically the same kind of thing that you did? I mean, that's you were vaccinated with the, the top forty rock. Well, I had a I had a more expansive morning show. I had you know a co-host, a production engineer, a regular producer, a news person, um, a weather person. It was a morning show Mm -hmm. um, that played music. Um, And this was like in the middle of the 90s. So it did not sound like WLS in the 70s. No. No. What are you doing now, aside from this interview? I am doing Monday through Thursday from 7 to 10 p.m. on WGN Radio in Chicago. WGN. Mm-hmm. They, you know, it, it uh, John, the talent that is in Chicago, uh, we, with, uh, all of us here on the East Coast, you know, we grew up listening to WABC and Cousin Bruce. Oh, I know, yeah. Those guys, you know. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but we were. Dan cl- Ingram. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, but we were close enough to the Midwest that we could hear uh, uh, the talent on in Chicago. And when I was working in Des Moines and we would drive back and forth. And when I worked in Kansas city, we would drive in the shadow of Chicago and listen to the likes of, uh, I never thought JP McCarthy was, or not McCarthy, but uh, Wally Phillips. I never, I really didn't care for his act, (laughs) but, (laughs) but uh, Roy Leonard, who was on after him, was oh, yeah. just superb. Right. Yeah. And, and you, you don't get that in a lot of markets where, you know, there's usually one or two stations that are really hot and, and then uh, the rest of them are just kind of also rands. But every time, every turn, uh, every place you turn in Chicago, there are these enormously talented people that make listening to radio fun. And, and that's what, that's what our mission in life is is i guess is to i think you're right yeah yeah. are you aware of of a guy i'm I'm gonna let you go here pretty quick uh, before i get another call from the veterinary hospital Uh, (laughs) but john i'm i'm gonna cut you loose here there are oh i want to ask about your daughter Uh, amy is her name Uh, yes yeah Yeah. she's got uh she's um an actress she's uh actor in los angeles yes voiceover actor and a and an actor uh, yeah. she's in the recent, um, uh, series on Showtime called Your Honor. Um, she's been on a, a SU, uh, SUV, the uh, Law and Order SUV. Oh God, yes. Everybody in the world has been on, I have a running joke with her yeah. that every actor on the <laughs> earth has been on one kind of Law and Order or another, whether it's Law and Order, Law and Order, I guess there was a, uh, Criminal and no, that's something else. But uh, Law and Order, SUV, uh, everybody has done their at least one stint mm-hmm. on one of those shows. Oh yeah, she's been on a couple of those, uh, not for a while, but um, yeah, yeah, she did those. Well, that's Absolutely. that's fun. Yeah, yeah. It, it's fun to see your your offspring's uh, following and. You know, be it there, uh, they look at you and they say, Hey, he did a pretty good job at this. And, and I learned from it and maybe I can make a living at it, you know, and, uh, yeah. that you inspired her uh, to do that. Your other daughter is uh, a writer. Well, uh, yes, she is a writer, but, um, more of her time now is spent being the lead. Tracy is her name, mm-hmm. uh, being the lead singer of a punk rock band in Los Angeles called the Walker Brigade. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. <laughs> you have quite a talented family. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. My daughter is uh, president of a uh, state university up in New York. Holy cow. And, <laughs> and uh, it's SUNY Adirondack up in uh, Queensbury, New York. In fact, I just yeah. did one of these programs with their communications professor. And, uh, she, wow. she was, you know, she was around the business her whole life. She saw me on TV. She, 
She yeah, was yeah. on radio with me on you know numerous occasions. Sure. And was not afraid to be on TV. Uh, and we used her in some commercials for our stations and so on. And so she is well equipped to meet the press. Uh, right. And and she she does such a great job on television. And I look at her and I say, she could be a network anchor. And right. but she doesn't want to do that. She wants to be in higher education, and that's all well and good. Well, yeah. J- John, let me ask president, you. President of a university is not too shabby. No, it isn't. No. No. No, the State University of New York at Adirondack. They, Amazing. They, uh, it, it was, at one time it was called this uh, Adirondack Community College. Mm-hmm. And the state of New York and a lot of other states are now trying to polish up the image of community colleges. Right. And so they are changing the name and incorporating them into the structure of the state university systems. Yeah, and so it is no longer Adirondack Adirondack Community College. Mm-hmm. It is SUNY State University of New York at Adirondack. It's still a two-year college, but they are a pathway college where they have agreements with universities, so that the students automatically at the end of two years are accepted at these uh, pathway universities. Right. So right. it's kind of a cool deal. Well, John, what a, what a great opportunity for me. I, I, I've interviewed a lot of people around the world, kings and presidents, and uh, I've had a very good run at it. And But I was really nervous uh, to, uh, to interview you, you know? No uh, need. I, well, it, you know, it's, I'm thinking to myself, I mean, uh, this guy, you know, I mean, he's the top of the heap. And... and uh, <laughs> But it, but it's been great. And the one final question I want to ask you. And sure. I don't want you to. I, I don't want you to think I'm asking you for specifics at all. Right. Uh, right. In the heyday of of your time at WLS, yeah. were you doing pretty well? I mean. Oh, you mean financially? Yeah. 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 Absolutely. I mean, in 1970 dollars, um, which if you said it today would not be. Um, extraordinary yeah but at the time sure good you bet i'm glad i mean it wasn't after a minimum wage oh no no okay, good. no no good. you had you had some leverage there you had those uh numbers <laughs> exactly that, that's always helpful right well our guest today john landecker uh it it is really a pleasure for me to uh talk to you and if anybody ever asks you again how many times you've been interviewed you can say i know of one <laughs> i will remember that yeah. <laughs> all right well i hope that someday our paths cross again and i i wish you the very best uh, uh belated uh birthday wish from a couple of weeks ago three weeks ago i guess did you, yeah. have, did you have a big birthday bash? Did uh, you no. thousands no, of no, friends no. gather around you? No, 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 no. I'm beyond that. Yeah, our dog has a bigger birthday party than I do. Right. Right on. <laughs> John Records, Landecker, thank you so much for being with us today. Well, thank you for asking. I had a great time. All right, are you still there?